My name is Alexandra Lundberg. Today is November 19th, 2010, and I'm in the George Sutherland Archives at the Utah Valley University Library. Um, today I'm interviewing Kathy Debenham as a nominee in the Utah Women's Walk as a notable win woman who has made significant contribution to life in the state of Utah. Okay. For background information, where were you born? I was born in Redwood City, California, which is on the peninsula about 20 miles south of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And that's, I grew up in neighboring town, San Carlos, and I attended schools there my whole life before I started uh, into university at University of California, and then I ended up transferring to Brigham Young University, which is where I met your parents eventually, because they were students there. Um, tell me about your family life, your parents, your siblings, where you fall. Okay. Um, my parents, Francis Joseph Parsons, Jr., and my mother, Eileen Smythe Parsons, um, were uh, parents that always encouraged education. That was something very, very important in our family. And um, it was just assumed that we would all go to college. And my mom in particular was a, a feminist before the feminist movement was identified as a feminist movement. She remembers, um, she remembers when she was in grade school in uh, Washington State in a small uh, kind of country school, the teachers having the students go outside for a break and running to the top of the hill behind the school. And she was a good runner, and this was about third grade. She got to the top of the hill first of everybody. And the teacher said, Eileen is first for the girls. And even at her young age, she thought, first for the girls? I was first for everybody. So I was raised with a mom that always believed that women had the, had the right and should have the opportunity to, to do what they wanted to do in life. So I always had that kind of um, encouragement to explore whatever it was I could do from both my parents. I am the second of four siblings. I have an older sister, a brother younger than I, and then a, a baby sister. And one of the things that I remember about my place in the family, I remember this when I was really young, and maybe I just like to feel sorry for myself, but I thought my older sister, um, she was special because she was the oldest, and she had a place in the family. And my brother was special and had a place in the family because he was the only boy. And then my younger sister was special because she was the baby and she knew her place in the family. But my place in the family was hard for me to define. And I remember feeling that at a young age. And I don't know if that has anything to do with kind of the striving to, to figure out where I fit or what I could offer. But I think birth order um, had a significant influence on me as I tried to figure out where do I fit and how do I contribute. Um, what were the some of the other important memories that you have from your childhood? I remember my dad taking us on Saturday morning hikes. There's a watershed um, in the, the hills above the San Francisco Bay behind west of my parents' home. And he used to take us on hikes and he would have, uh, which I now realize would be antiques and I should have kept track of them, but his army knapsack, he'd pack everything in and we'd take our, our collie dog, Danny Boy, and um, we have pictures of my older sister Linda and I, you know, up in the hills somewhere with my dad being on a hike. And I realize now, probably my mother said to him, I need a little time by myself, so why don't you take the kids on a hike? But that was just always so important for us to have that time outdoors with my dad. We were a camping family. We were, a, we were an active family. My mom was a physical education major, and so she was always out on the lawn doing gymnastics and you know, tumbling with us, and uh, we were encouraged to be active um, in our family. I think that was a formative experience. Um, was your mom the one that originally taught you dance? No, no, but she provided opportunities for dance classes. You know, I went in and had the little Madame Melba, you know, uh, fire tap hula and fire baton. You know, we we make a joke about it in in the dance community, but it was just a commercial dance studio. That's where I first began participating. My mom tells me, I don't remember this one, but my mom tells me, and I think this is one of my early experiences that led me to dance. My older sister, Linda, 18 months older than I, was taking a tap dance class. 
And my mom would wait in a, like a, a waiting area outside. And, and if she took her eye off me, I was in the back of the class. So when I was less than three years old, I wanted to be in a dance class. And, and as she reflects on it, she said, yeah, I mean, she even says, when I was nine months old, um, I was in the middle of the room with some toys. And one day I just stood up and started walking. And she said, and you started running shortly thereafter, and you haven't stopped since. So, I, I, you know, I've had this kind of inner propulsion going on, I think, um, from the time I was little. I think I came with it. <laughs> so tell me a little bit more about your background in dance, like where you performed um, and what type of dance training, training you received in your life. One of the really formative experiences for me in high school was with uh, my teacher, Cheryl Reed. Um, this was in Carlmont High School. Um, and I participated in a project she was doing for her master's project. She went to San Francisco State to do her master's. And at the time, that was one of the very respected uh, master's degree programs in the country. And she was doing a project demonstrating um, kind of the state of dance in the high school curriculum and that would have been in the late 1960s. And um, she, I think she auditioned a group of us uh, to participate and we would go very early. I remember I lived, I lived up on the hill above the high school and cut down through the fields, which of course now are houses, but, um, and I, would, it, I, I saw the world in a whole nother way that early in the morning, seeing the deer um, in the field uh, to get down to rehearsal. And so we, we put together a lecture demonstration that we then toured around to various places saying this is this is how dance is a part of the curriculum in the high schools in the state of California and that that was the first time I was introduced to the idea of composition or choreography because coming out of a commercial dance background where you just do whatever you know flap will change flap will change the the teachers teaching you the idea of having your own idea that precipitates yeah, that generates new movement is that was a whole new idea for me and it really appealed to me that I could have a sense of who I am as a mover be the the moving force rather than replicating what someone else did so that was I think the first time that I understood dance could be a serious course of study and the you know I hung out with the smart kids in in high school and you know they went off and did degrees in medicine and you know they're all over the world doing very important things now um, but for me there was a there was not only an intellectual component to dance but of course there's that whole physical and then the artistic that um, those things for the first time I saw they could be together you didn't have to be just smart in this way but you could be smart in other ways so that's where I started. Then when I went into college, I started at University of California, Santa Barbara. And um, I, I took dance classes there. And I had a woman named Issa Bergson, who has since passed away. Um, after University of California, she went down to Arizona State University and finished her career there. Issa was a dancer from Europe. And she danced after World War II with a woman named Mary Wiegmann, which if you study dance history, you know Mary Wiegmann was a student of Rudolf Laban. And she was a key figure in, in um, bringing dance, German contemporary modern dance, to America and contributing to the, the dance history here. Issa danced with Mary Wiegmann in the bombed out theaters in Europe after World War II. I didn't get that when I was this kind of dumb freshman at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I knew that she was a very impassioned, um, clear German accent. I can still hear her as we're going across the floor with leaps or jumps and she'd say, don't you lose your feet like potato smashers. <laughs> and we just thought she was kind of this um, interesting character. Then, years later, when I was a faculty member at BYU, she came to do a summer workshop. And it was there when I was kind of matured as a profession, professional in the dance field, I realized who I was studying with. And this was, this was dance history. This was that linkage of tissue and, and blood and cell and bone that goes forward in dance. And I had a chance 
to study at a later date with Issa, and I came to understand things in a whole different way because of that. And then later, I became certified in Laban movement analysis. And of course, Issa studied with the pupil that, through which Rudolf Laban derived most of his theory, because it was it, it, the theory grew from movement. And Mary Vigman would move, and he would write reams of notes and his notation, and 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 I was that close to that, but I didn't know it. And then when I came to do the integrated movement studies program at the University of Utah, it felt like another link had come together. It kind of by no intention of my own. I just happened to be in the place that allowed me to connect those pieces. So those were kind of formative things. I did my um, I did my first two years at University of California. I transferred to UC Berkeley uh, within the UC system, and the the theater there they had these huge Greek urns in the in the corners of the of the studio. It was a beautiful place uh, to study dance. That was at the height of the Vietnam War. Uh, protest and the University of California campus was just a hotbed for protest and and had been when I was a student um, across the bay a high school student you know there were protests going on in um, anti-war protests at uh, University or at San Francisco State University and I remember once one of one of the uh, my friends one of these smart kids that I hung out with they got some black armbands from the students at UC Santa Barbara or UC San Francisco and we thought, oh, we'll be cool, we'll wear them to school. We were in the principal's office like that. Where did you get those and what are you doing with them? And of course, this is the student body president and, you know, these are the good kids, you know. But we were realizing we were in a changing society and that things weren't all right and how do we participate in them? So I was already in that whole kind of um, the, the unrest and the, the, the discomfort that was present in society. And when I was at University of California, Berkeley, that was the semester of Kent State, which is when five students were shot. Um, and we were, um, I remember being in a chemistry class in one of the lecture halls, the chemistry lecture halls that go down into the ground. And the tear gas would hang in the trees, and then it would drop out of the trees and seep down, and we'd have to leave the room because even though there wasn't, you know, an active tear gas uh, grenade being thrown, it disrupted the classes. And finally, with the semester of Kent State, or the occurrence of Kent State, um, the whole university system was shut down for five days because it was just so, the students were just so upset. So at that time, well, and I should say the semester before that, I had been at UC Santa Barbara and in the student community where I lived adjacent to it, Goleta, the students were marching and protesting and they they brought in riot police from all over Southern California and they were in their full um, uh, uh, riot gear so they had the gas masks that made them look like they were humans and they had these uh, they were like dump trucks full of just just full of these police officers in their riot gear and the students lit the Bank of America branch just I could see it from my balcony where I uh, lived. They lit it on fire and a student was shot. So that's kind of, the whole world had gone crazy as far as I was concerned. And I had a sister who was going to school here at Brigham Young University, which of course supported in a patriotic way the troops in Vietnam, whether or not people disagreed with the Vietnam War, I'm sure there were, but it did not happen on this campus. And that's when I transferred here. And I finished my degree in the Brigham Young University program, which is, was then and still is, the largest dance program in the country, most diverse because it has not only contemporary dance, but uh, ballet and modern dance and folk dance. And that's unusual among dance programs. And I was there at a time when they were in a building process. And I learned a lot because I got in on the ground floor of the building of a dance program. And as a graduate student there, I created the Dancers Company, which was the, the touring group that then would go out and has toured internationally, continues to. So I had opportunities to kind of be a part of building a program, which I then see saw years later, prepared me to start the program here. So I had been through that and I thought, okay, I know how to do this. I know who to ask about this. I have contacts in the state. 
and that served me very well when I was hired as the first country, uh, first tender track dance faculty member here at UBU to build a program. So, you know, things don't happen by mistake, but we don't know in what sequence they're necessarily going to happen. Um, so would you say that, well, how do you feel about the arts in education here? In Utah? Yes. Um, I believe the arts are at the heart of education. I think in a metaphoric way, but also in a very uh, real way. I think the arts help us understand about what this experience of being human is and how we can communicate and how we can identify those things that um, allow us as a community to come together and to celebrate and to reflect and to, uh, and to really consider what we value in terms of putting things out into a community to enhance the life of a community as opposed to being destructive of a life in a community. So I think they, they really play a key role in education since education is about a whole person. And frequently, I think we think about educating a head. You know, there's a child sitting in a seat and I want to make sure they're head gets information, whether it's math or reading. Or, but in reality, you've got a whole person and you've got this physical body that houses the mind and there's a connection between mind-body and I would say mind-body and spirit, not in a religious way, but in a, a sense of the soul of an individual. And in order to be able to have true education that is transformative, you must address the body, the mind, and the spirit. And the arts are the best way to address that spiritual component, while at the same time, they have a content base, which has the, the rigor of a curriculum, where you understand what the principles and the theories and the processes are. So from, from pre-K, when, uh, when I taught at the Waterford Schools and Meridian Schools, when this was when um, my kids were young, when you were not even around yet <laughs> within your family, um, I taught three-year-olds through high school in the Waterford School. I developed that curriculum where every week those students had an opportunity to be in class as, as the grade school or as a fine arts class in the middle school and high school. And then I would go to my classes at the university. So I'd be teaching really three-year-olds through university. And I appreciated at that time that it's an enriching part of life at all stages of life, and that there's something very fundamentally important about it, developmentally, and to help with the with the breadth of your life as well as the depth of your life. So, to me, you can't have an educated person without having the arts be a, a, a serious component of that. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, do you feel like you have? a specific life's mission or are you finding out as you go? Mm. You know, I came across a quote from Helen Keller a few years ago, and I'll see if I can remember what it is. Um, life is a daring adventure, or it's nothing, to keep our faces towards change and behave like free spirits in the presence of fate is strength undefeatable. And I had that on the back of my front door for probably about three years. And every day, coming and going, I would see that and I would, I would be reminded that your life can be purposeful even with unexpected occurrences in your life. So Yes, I believe I have a mission. I have a purpose. And I think if, if I was to look at it in the, in, from the 30,000 foot level, my purpose is to somehow contribute positively to the world, to my community, to my family, to my friends, to my students, um, in, the, in the time that I'm on this earth. That's, that's my overall mission. But it can happen through education. It can happen through community work. I just came back from an Orem Arts Council meeting. 
I was asked to be a founding member of the Orem Arts Council, and I have just loved learning what's it like to be civically engaged. Because I, you know, I knew there was a city council, and I knew there were commissions and all this, but I didn't know what it was like to be an advising body to the mayor and the city council. And last week we had we had an item on the agenda. It was supposed to be on for eight thirty. I showed up about eight fifteen. Our agenda item did not get on until 11.30. It was midnight by the time we got out of there because there was a very hot issue on prior to when we were there that, that blew up in a way that the council mm -hmm. didn't expect. And I thought, you know, this is, this is what it means to be civically engaged. Spending four hours over at the Orem Library waiting for your turn to talk to the city council about the proposal for a bandstand in the park. You know, So I think our purpose is to to contribute from whatever well that we have within us to provide opportunities for others to grow, to change, to experience joy. That's what I think my purpose is. And so I find it through my family, I find it through my community, I find it through my church, I find it through my job. And I've learned to, I used to, I used to separate those, but I'm finding more and more particularly since being in an administrative capacity, because I didn't set out to be an administrator. I told you walking over here, I didn't say, oh yeah, I'm gonna be a vice president one of these days. <laughs> um, someone said, you have an ability to do this, would you help? And that's kind of how I found my way. And first of all, I thought, gosh, this, you know, how do I, how do I still be an artist in this? And then I realized I am who I am, no matter what job I'm doing. And my perspectives are informed by my discipline. And so those, those should come out. And you know, I can't tell you how many times dance comes up as an example. When I'm in a, in a, in a meeting of administrators discussing programs at the university, or the arts in general will come up. And so I advocate for the arts in a very different way now than when I'm teaching students face to face, which I love and, I'm, and, I, and I miss dreadfully. But I feel like I'm, I'm doing some good where I am. And I do want to go back to full-time teaching before I retire because that's where I feel like that's where my heart is and that's why I'm doing the job I'm doing now so that I can let faculty do the jobs that they love to do by doing the job that I do I let them do that and it's, it's, it's a you take your turn are there any words of wisdom or maxims that you've lived your life by? I know you said the Hel Helen Keller quote. Um, yeah. You know, my grandmother, my, my dad's mom, she was a, a very important influence in my life. I think both my grandmothers were. She did not have the benefit of a college education, but she wanted to make sure that all of her grandchildren did. And she always encouraged us, wrote letters to us. She didn't have means to be able to you know, support us. Um, but she would always encourage us, and she used to say, this makes me teary when I remember, she used to say, Kathleen, hitch your wagon to a star. And I thought, what a great thing to tell your grandkids, hitch your wagon to a star. And of course, that comes out of a, of a, a very different context in, in which she lived her life. But um, I think it, it was evidence of the kinds of encouragement that she provided to all of us. And so I've thought about that a lot. Um, my mother used to say to us, <laughs> don't be a she, thank you. <laughs> Which meant think for yourself. You know, don't follow what the crowd is doing. Think for yourself. You were given a brain, now use it. You know, so that, that one I hear um, a lot in my head. Um, there's another one about do all the good you can in all the ways you can to all the people you can, with every opportunity you can. Um, and I have that on my computer at work because I think that's ultimately what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be making a contribution. And if you have a gift to do that in some way, shape, or form, you better figure out how to do it. Okay, two, two more questions. Okay, I won't cry anymore, I promise. <laughs> What advice do you have for younger women in your field? And then we'll continue with, what would you ultimately like to be remembered for? Oh, for younger women. Um, in my field specifically? Mm -hmm. um, 
I think I would say I, I've heard a lot of um, students say, "How do you how do you put family with with a, a, a career or a profession?" That uh, my own daughters, uh, Marnie, just finished her MFA in modern dance at the University of Utah, wrote a beautiful thesis, um, and the whole process of that thesis was as she struggled through miscarriages to have a baby. She finally had the baby. The topic of the thesis is the pregnant body in Western concert dance and why it is considered a disruptive body. And she lived through that while she produced this thesis. And she struggled. And she finally realized that that life process was what allowed her to finish her artistic process. And I think if women who want to have a career in the dance field have a desire, not that they have to, but if they have a desire to have a career and a family, it is possible. It is not easy. I was at the Synergy Dance Concert the other night here at UVU, and um, you know I started the Synergy Dance Company 17 years ago, and I look at these beautiful dancers out there now and how far the programs come, it thrills me. There were two, there were two members of the uh, of Synergy performers that are moms that have two and three kids. And I think that's extraordinary. It is possible. It's not easy. You have to have a support system. You have to figure out what you're going to let go. But you can find a way to blend them. And I think the historical and the canon in dance would be, oh, you cannot have children because it will ruin your career. In fact, in Marnie's research for her thesis, she did this extensive interview. And there was a faculty member from an institution in Nevada who said um, there was a student in their department who, not married, became pregnant, was counseled by the faculty to have an abortion because it would ruin her dance career, and the student did. And I think, how can we as educators, how dare we give that kind of, of how, how, we, how dare we wield that kind of power over a student, over a question as personal as that? So I think it would be, it is possible to have career, to have family, to have an ability to contribute in the community. It may not be as a performing dancer up on the stage, but you know, you might, you might take the, 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 the dancer out of the studio or off the stage, but you still have that dancing spirit inside of you. And that's what you take with you, and that's what you make contributions with. So the other piece of advice would be um, consider all the many ways you can use your love of dance or of the arts um, to be a part of your life. And, and there are unexpected ways that it can really enrich your life as well as other people's lives. And what would you like to be remembered for, personally? <laughs> what would, I don't know. I guess I just <laughs> never thought of being remembered. What would I like to be remembered for? Um, I guess it's being, being a fearless champion for students to fulfill, to fulfill their potential, and to and to nurture their their dreams of what might be, and and when I say students, I say I like to do that within my own family. One of the things I do, I've got seven darling grandchildren that I just love to pieces. This this may be another one that makes me cry. Um, I, every time I see one of them or talk to them on the phone, I always say somewhere in the conversation, I love you one million. And Marnie, our middle daughter, is in Shanghai right now. So I don't get to see little Ollie, who is two years old. But on eyesight the other night, he said, I love you one million, Nani. And that is worth everything to know that you have that connection with people and, and they know you'll be there for them through thick and thin. And I think that's ultimately what what more could any of us 
want from someone or um, really have tremendous satisfaction from being able to provide for someone. I almost cried again. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything else that you would like to have recorded about your life that we didn't get to? No, this is already embarrassing enough to have my life recorded. Uh, well, I would like to ask a question. Are you done? Um, Do yes. you have any others? I don't have any others. I would love for you to answer what advice you would like to give to Utah women in general, not just dancing women or dance, dancers, yeah. but what advice or life experience could you share with just women in general? Women in general. Um, gosh, I think the, the good that I see that is accomplished by women in the community, whether it's Louise Wallace, who's over at the Orem Library, I used to think dancers did it all, but now I think librarians do it all. <laughs> they know how to get things done, and I think, um, the women that I have worked with over the years know how to get things done in collaborative ways, in ways that bring people together that don't, that don't worry about who gets the credit. The most important thing is, is to make something happen in a positive, to have a positive effect. And so I would say look for the opportunities to work certainly with all members of the community, but with other women yeah. on those causes or initiatives or um, issues that you think are important. And n to, to, s to not be afraid to reach across, um, if there's someone that's really good in politics, to not be afraid to work with a person who's in dance and vice versa. So that you, in the same way that I value interdisciplinary work, which is one of the things I've loved about being at UVU, is I've been able to work across discipline boundaries to enrich my understanding of my own discipline as well as introduce other people to my discipline. I think that can happen in the community. So that, so that you cross fertilize and you have those, those perspectives that inform each other. Um, and, and I think working to, to encourage young women we have a terrible problem in Utah of young women not going to college and not completing college. Once we get them in college, they complete at a higher rate than the males. But we have the inverse relationship right now. We've got, we've got about 46% female and maybe it's even less than that, 43, 57. It's inverse the national average. And so there's a missing piece. How are we getting the, the, the young women in high school to say, I want to do it, I can do that, it's important for me to do that, to give them the tools. So I think, I think as women in Utah that have had the benefit of an education and that have access to make these connections happen, I would encourage us all to do that because we, we really do significantly change the profile of a culture or a society by the education that the parents themselves have achieved. And so if we begin to have generations of, of children being raised by mothers that have not had the opportunity or taken the opportunity for higher education, I think our society is poorer for it. So that, that's kind of the thing right now that I think is really crucial for us. That's good advice, very good advice. What about other women? Did you ask her about women you admire, women you have mentored you? Uh, women that have mentored me. Uh, yeah, I, I have had women that have mentored me. I mentioned Cheryl Reed, who was my high school dance teacher. I, I took a, a class from her um, at the community college uh, one, one summer, and she continued to encourage me early on in, in my field. Um, I also had a wonderful teacher in high school named Roz Lang, Rosalind Lang. She was the uh, uh, sewing, home economics teacher, and she was spunky as all get out and smart and funny, and um, she and her husband were both Chinese, no, they were Korean, they were Korean, and that was the first kind of engagement I had with someone truly from another cultural background. 
she had me in her home a lot and she just she just really embraced me as a person as well as a, a student and I think I, ha I was really fortunate in high school to have those two mentors one in an area I was interested in and one that um, just kind of uh, took an interest in me and supported me and uh, I mean, I think she was the one, I got this Bank of America Achievement Award when I was in, in high school, and she was the one that recommended me for it. Um, at the time, I, I didn't realize what a significant impact that would have had, but it really did. And so I think teachers don't, re don't realize the power that they have to influence lives. Or maybe their students don't understand the influence that they're benefiting from when they're benefiting from it. And then years down the road, you haven't had a chance to say it. Um, so they were, my, my two grandmothers, my other grandmother, I told you about uh, my dad's mom, my mom's mom. Uh, we have, a, we have a, a, a lineage of educators. She was a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse in Camas, Washington State. And she would, she would get up at about 4 o'clock to get through the snow to the schoolhouse to start the fire so it was warm when the kids were there. Uh, that was her background. She actually was the youngest of all of her siblings, um, and when she was, I think, four, she trotted off after her o older siblings, and it was a long way to walk to the school where she, that was like eventually the school that she taught in. It was so far to get there that they didn't send her home, and so she started school early because she just craved that education. So she was a teacher, my mom became a, a teacher, uh, my older sister, uh, although she's never taught, she's certified. I'm a teacher, and I have uh, two nieces that are teachers now. So um, that grandmother, who, when I knew her, she was way past her teaching years, um, but she was a very thoughtful, thoughtful woman that obviously um, had a had a, a vision of education and why it was important to be a part of your life. I also remember she grew these dahlias that were about this big outside her. She was a gardener. And in my next life, I would want to be a gardener. That's what I'd like to be remembered for, a master gardener. <laughs> I'm not there yet. But <laughs> um, and then I'm trying to think of any other women. I have been fortunate, um, Reba Keel, who is a faculty member here. I had Reba um, in a class at BYU, and this is years ago, um, in a test and measurements for my certification class. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time, I didn't really know her, she taught in a whole different department than the dance department, um, but in the education class I had a chance, I thought, boy, she's smart. And then years later, she came here, mm -hmm. and she teaches here now in the uh, community health department, and I had a chance, it's kind of like that Issa Bergson thing, I came around again. And her perspective, after having been a, a, a faculty member and regent and a dean, it was just really important to have that piece. Uh, Janice Geeky, who was uh, just retired as a ma marketing professor here, has been a dear friend and mentor in many ways. Mm -hmm. We were associate deans together, and um, she's had another other set of experiences that I have, and I've really, I've really learned. Thank you. Those are all <laughs> things I'd like to hear about that. Thank you for your time. You're welcome.